Holy Ghost that she sent my confirmation. He, 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 he spoke through the baby. So what do, you, what do you, let me ask you this question. What do you sense that God has specifically said to you concerning your destiny in life? What has God said to you? What has he spoken to you? What has he revealed to you specifically now? Um, I, I know that as kingdom people, we all have uh, a common destiny. We all have uh, general uh, common promises that, and that are ours. But, but, but God uh, moves from the general and, and he comes down to uh, specifics and particulars. And, and he deals with us as individuals because we are all created with purpose. We are all created with promise. And, and, and whether you realize it or not, you are heading somewhere. Oh, yeah. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, you, you headed somewhere. You, you're on your way somewhere, but, uh, but do you know where that is? I remember back in the 70s, back in the 70s, you know, I was in the church, but not in Christ. And, and I remember that there was a song that hit my conscience while I was sitting in a movie theater. I was not thinking about God at all. I was doing my thing. I don't know who I was there at the movie. It doesn't matter. But, but I remember that, that when this song came on the screen and, and uh, Diana Ross was singing it and we were in the movie entitled Mahogany. And... And the song, as I still hear it, raised prophetic questions. Even then, my mind was not on God. My mind was on doing my own thing. But, but the words hit me. And the words asked some prophetic questions. And simple but challenging. Do you know where you're going to? Y'all remember that? Do, do you like the things that life is showing you? Where are you going to? Do you know? Huh? That, that, that was prophetic even in that day. I didn't understand it as prophetic, but it hit me. It started to, to, to say something inside of me. And then she went on to say, do you get what you're hoping for? When you look behind you, there's no open doors. What are you hoping for? Do you know? In other words, when you look behind you, the doors are closed. You can't go back through uh, where you've already come. You got, to, you got to understand that everything now is in front of you. All right? And it woke something up in me even then. Do you know where you're going to? Ask your neighbors and neighbor, do you know? Uh, do, are you getting? Are you getting the things that you're hoping for? And and, and so uh, God, when I thought about that, God has a purpose. God has a plan uh, for each one of us, and we all have to get in touch and remain in touch with the plan and the purpose for God in our lives. And and we've got to be comfortable enough uh, to be unique enough not to push yourself into somebody else's plan and attempt to be identified through their plan. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you got a plan. And, and, you know, some of our issue is that we see other folks' plan and purpose, and we try to adopt it as our plan and purpose, but God wants us to be unique. God said, I have made you. Uh, you are an individual. We work in unison and in cooperation with each other, but everybody has a specific purpose in the earth. Do you know what it is? You got to understand then that if you don't understand your purpose, then you will spend a whole lot of time 
wandering around, unsure, uncertain. And, and I have to say, even when you have sensed God's purpose in your life, uh, I have seen where God has given me purpose. I have heard what he said. I have sensed what God was doing. And what did I do? I allowed a delay. I allowed an interruption or even my own inattention to cause me to lose the focus, lose the sight as to where I was heading. Anybody ever been there? You got to just acknowledge sometimes you get off course. Sometimes you start chasing things that you ought not be chasing. Sometimes you just end up doodling and sitting there and spinning when God has shown you who I've created you to be, who I've ordained you to be, your purpose in the earth. And when God is moving you through life, you may come to a place where you have to burn some stuff down. Or God will burn some stuff down. All right? Such is the case in this chapter of Exodus here, uh, chapter number 32. Are y'all still with me? God is in the process, when we engage this text, God uh, was in the process of moving his people as he promised Abraham. He said, I'm going to make you a great nation. And uh, Abraham was uh, uh, an Israelite. And the Israelite people uh, descended from Abraham. And he promised that I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to take you into a place of promise. I'm going to make the nations great. And people are going to be blessed by your family, Abraham. And, and so uh, as history went, they went down. The people of Israel uh, encountered uh, some slavery in Egypt. And God sent Moses to deliver them uh, out uh, of Egypt. And, and uh, then we discovered that they are on their way they are progressing they are moving they have left bondage they have been set free they uh, they've got a new agenda and and so he's moving them and as God was moving the people uh, he called his servant leader Abraham uh, excuse me Moses he called Moses up to the mountain. He said, Moses, come up to the mountain. I want to talk to you. I want you to receive some further instructions on life and relationship with my people. I want you to take these words back down to them, give them the instructions. And while Moses was up in the mountain with God, God speaking to Moses, the Bible says that it had been nearly 40 days. And it seemed like a long time to the people uh, that they had not heard from Moses. And so we go then to verse number, chapter number 32, verse number 1. It says, now when the people saw that Moses delayed, tell your neighbor, be careful about a delay. When the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. Now understand, we can understand that, okay, Moses came in and uh, they had been hearing him speak. Uh, all that time to Pharaoh and in preparation to, to leave Egypt. And then uh, he led them out and now suddenly he is missing. So we can, we can kind of understand that they were a little upset um, in this delay. But you got to be careful because sometimes we do the wrong thing in times of delay. Moses was not there, and, and so uh, this delay, he, he delayed, the Bible said, in coming, and this delay led to dissatisfaction, and the dissatisfaction led to despair, and the despair uh, led to diversion, and diversion led to deception, and deception led to deliriousness. 
That's what the delay did for them. Don't let it do that for you. Delay led to dissatisfaction. And when they became dissatisfied, uh, it led to despair. They didn't know what to do. They were hopeless and helpless. And their despair led to a diversion. They were now getting ready to get off course. They were on a course. They were following purpose. And the diversion led to deception. They believed now they could take matters into their own hand. And deception led to del deliriousness. And the result was they were so delirious that they were ready, get this, to attempt to create and assign their destiny to human ingenuity. Isn't that crazy? They were so delirious. They said, listen, we don't know where Moses is. We need to take things into our own hands, and we need uh, to create us a God. We need to create something that is going to lead us into destiny. And I got to tell us this morning that human ingenuity that is absent of God becomes an idol. Something that you have ascribed to as having sufficiency to direct your life, to direct your course, to take you where uh, you need to go, to fulfill your assignment in the world. And the major problem, the major problem, whenever you can craft and name your God rather than accepting the one who saved you, delivered you, and graced you, and guarantees you certain promises, you got to be careful because you're on dangerous ground. Be careful because it is possible that without full awareness of just when it happened, we erect idols too. We erect idols in our lives that attempt to take the place of truth. And anything that attempts to take the place of truth is an idol. I don't care what it is, all right? All right? It's trying to replace who God is and who God has called us to be. You remember, you know, last week we were talking about uh, the Galatians, and, and Paul said, oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? You were running well. You've been set free. You've been made free. Don't go back and allow anything to shackle you. Uh, don't go back and try to create any kind of system to get you to the place that God has already ordained that I will take you. Are there folk here today? Go back to Exodus 32. He says, he says, bring, Aaron in verse number two said to them, break off the gold and the earrings which are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. Now, now we got to understand that it is only an idol when you have made it a substitute for truth. Who God is. Now understand this the people had wealth. All right? The people had, we'll say, possessions. They had some things. Don't, don't go on the misnomer that things and wealth means idle automatically. All right? Because when the people left Egypt, God, get this, God made sure that they left full. They were full of promises and they were full of provision. Go back over to Exodus chapter number 12. Exodus chapter number 12, and they're getting ready to leave Egyptian captivity. They're being set free, God has taken them to the place. He promised, go down to verse number 34 of chapter number 12, and it says this. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing, and the Lord had given the people favor 
in the sight of the Egyptians so that they granted them what they requested. Thus, they plundered uh, the Egyptians. In other words, God, God caused them to gain wealth. All right? God caused them to gain financial stability. God said, I'm, you're going to leave full. You're going to leave blessed. I don't have anybody. And, and we have now gone on the misnomer that God doesn't want you blessed. Uh, it means something perverted. And it's only that when we have tried to substitute it for God. I can't get anybody in here today. You want a good job. You, you want to have wealth. You want to have uh, some property. You, God wants you to. Can I get anybody? You see, you see, it's only an idol when you've made it a substitute for truth. <clears throat> God blessed them, and God had a purpose for the blessing. He knew. He said, listen, I don't want you to go out into the wilderness empty. Now, there were no stores there. They couldn't go to a mall. But he said, I want you to have it because I'm going to call on what I blessed you with because there's going to be a need for it. And the same thing is true in the earth today. God needs his people blessed. All right. God did not have a problem with their wealth. We make it a problem when we use it to be a substitute for God. I used to believe that rich people couldn't go to heaven. Rich people didn't have relationship with God. We, because, listen, we were sold that. That if you're going to really be saved, you got to be real broke. You got to be real scuffling. You got to be real poor. You got to look really bad. Come on, somebody. You, you, you were told that brand of religion, weren't you? That you got the, the worse you look, the better off you are in God. Huh? The most broken down you could look, the better off you are to God. But that's not scriptural. It, it's only a problem when we try to substitute God for that that God has blessed us with. I can't get anybody. This text shows us that God didn't have a problem with their wealth. He didn't have a problem with what they had. And he doesn't have a problem with what you have today. It only becomes a problem when it's misused. Some of us say, man, who, who wants to be blessed? Maybe you're not, you might not be where you are. You might not be where you want to be, but can I get anybody who says, but God, you please make me that way. Please put it in my hand. Please do whatever. I, come on, somebody. See, we've gotten afraid of it. The enemy has spooked us, and he only wants now us to believe that all those folk who are out uh, doing uh, all kinds of things in the world are the only ones that are supposed to have. But God wants everybody on your row blessed. Look up and down your row and, and speak blessed. God wants all of you blessed, 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 prosperous. He said in his word, I would that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Listen, tell your neighbor, don't be afraid of it. Just don't make it your God. See, it becomes an idol then. And an idol, it, you know, sometimes it's what I have accomplished. Sometimes it's what I have accumulated. Sometimes it's what I have achieved. And it has taken the place of the one who gave the grace to see it through in the first place. God doesn't have a problem with your accomplishments. God doesn't have a problem with your accumulation. He doesn't have a problem uh, with what you have achieved. As a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy, he said, listen, don't you forget I'm the one who gave you the power to get whatever it is you got. Whatever you got coming to you, don't you ever forget it was God that gave you power. It wasn't your own intellect. It was God that gave you the grace to get that degree, to get that good job. It was God to open up that door. I can't get anybody here because the only thing you can see right now is that you got a pile of bills and you ain't got no money for it so you can't shout. You don't want to shout because you don't believe that that's what God wants. Let me tell you, there are a whole lot of things we're in that God doesn't want us in but you ought to begin to shout about it before you get out of it in preparation. I can't get anybody in here. Don't wait until the battle is over. You ought to praise God now. God said, I want you to be because whenever I bless you, I got some kingdom things that I'm going to do in the body. So an idol is whenever we allow sometimes even religion to be more significant 
than the God that the religion points to. Huh? We, we then inappropriately ascribe flesh over spirit. That's when the idol comes. All right? Israel was blessed and they had followed God. God had fed them manna in the morning. Come on, somebody. God had given them manna. God had parted the Red Sea. God had brought water out of the rock. Yes, he was using the man of God, Moses, but you got to recognize that it's all God. I can't get anybody. Moses was just a vessel. He was just an earthen vessel, but it was God that was supplying their need. And listen, just because Moses was up in the mountain 40 days didn't change the fact that they were still eating every day. I can't get anybody. When he left Aaron and her down there, uh, God didn't say that as long as Moses is with you, I'll supply your need. He said, listen, Moses was up in the mountain, but God was still causing manna to come every morning. And here they are now, ready to shift because they hit a delay. I can't get anybody. Huh? They hit a delay. And guess what happened? It's in the text. Go back over. They hit a delay. It says it right there in my Bible. Moses delayed coming down from the mount. That's chapter 32 and back at verse number 1. Delay. Whenever they hit this delay... Self-motivation and deception caused them to believe they could create their own mechanism for reaching destiny. Mm, mm, mm. Don't, and listen, don't be too hard on them. Because some of us have been deceived enough to think that we can create our own mechanism for reaching destiny. We like shortcuts. We, we like self-contrived strategies. We like our own terms. We like our own methods. And then you got to understand that uh, we have become so inundated with culture. Man, culture has come into us in such heavy doses. You know? It's almost like I don't want to contradict what I just said. But culture has hit us so much because we have exposure now. Uh, we have privilege, opportunity, and we utilize that privilege and opportunity, and it has now become a distraction from our full purpose in God. We got culture in us so much so that many times you can't tell us from anybody else. Huh? No, 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 Sunday, yeah, okay, okay, let me, let me, let me, uh, Sunday, yeah, I, yeah, oh yeah, I know, Sunday, uh, but I'm talking about when, when we go back and, and, and we're included in the society, that, that's where, and, and we, we are so filled with culture, we're so filled with the ideals of the day, and, and even now we're at a point of believing conflicting doctrines. And I want to suggest to us that it has caused us to make choices that don't align with Christ, but it satisfies our flesh. Come on, somebody. See, see, we, we are full of culture. We're full of modern ideals. We're full of believing conflicting doctrines. And let me tell you something. Any doctrine that leads you away from the word of God is the doctrine of the devil. And sometimes we get so caught up on doctrinal issues and arguments that now we have made them an idol and forgotten about the God they're supposed to point to. I can't get to or three. Understand then that we, we, we have done a little mixing of Christianity with Judaism. Now, I just say Judaism that just represents dead works, all right? I'm not saying you're practicing Judaism, but when, when God began to rebuke Judaism, he was talking about dead works, things that don't bless, things that don't bring life, and, and things that can't uh, bring full deliverance. And, and we have mixed Christianity. We are mixing everything with spirituality. Who has bewitched us? 
culture, society, the enemy. We have been mixing the forbidden and the profane with faith in order to get our hope for results. But it will never, can I look at your neighbor and say, it will never and can never lead to a God-ordained destiny. And I say that, what did I say? <laughs> can never, will never lead to a God-ordained destiny. If we're going to accomplish and get to the place that God said, we got to do it God's way. Holistically, purely, all right? Now, now so then, um, when, we look at, when we look at the text, they said, look at verse 2. And Aaron said to them, break off the golden earrings. Well, no, let's go back to the verse 1. He says, he said, they said to Aaron, come make us gods that shall go before us. You get that? Make us some gods that's going to lead us. All right? Because we don't know where Moses is who brought us out of the land of Egypt, incidentally. We don't know what has become of him. And Aaron said, break off the earrings and the gold and all that. So the people broke off the gold earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molten calf. Then he said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now how crazy. Delirious. Crazy. Huh? And listen, you can say what or who was responsible for your deliverance all you want to, but when it is God, you can't change that. Now think about it. The Israelites were brought out before the calf ever existed. So, so they, it's crazy. They, 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 they're delirious. They, they hit a delay and they lost it. They, they hit a delay and they began to panic. They hit a delay and, 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 and quickly turned. The Bible says in one translation, they quickly turned when they did not see Moses coming back. And they said that this is the God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. How can you create something in a place where you're already delivered and try to go back and say, that's what brought you over. I can't get anybody in here. See, you got to understand, brothers and sisters, that, uh, that uh, uh, wherever my place in God is, uh, it's already finished before anything I have ever done or ever will do. It's all, God already sees it. He sees the end from the beginning. In other words, there's no need in me now coming up saying that uh, this particular thing is what delivered me. My degree delivered me. My education delivered me. My resources delivered me. No. How am I going to come and to uh, put my hands on something that just came into reality and say that's what delivered me? No, I got to look back and like the older people said, when my soul looks back and wonders, I can change it now. I don't have to wonder how I got over. I know how I got over. It was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that brought me out of darkness and brought me into the marvelous light. I don't have any business trying to ascribe that it's my position, it's my place, my status that brought me over. It was God that brought me over. You cannot create anything. You can't establish anything that you can go back and ascribe that that's what brought you through. I don't have anybody in here today. The people experienced a delay, and they needed to see a God. And so Aaron said, bring me the gold. Now, now, I just want to show something here. If you go back, I'm not going to read it. Moses in chapter number 31 is in the mountain with God. God is speaking to him. He said, I've called by name Baziel the son of Uriah, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the spirit of God and wisdom and understanding and knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works to work in gold, silver, and bronze. Now, come on, somebody. God said, I got plans for what I blessed you with. 
when he brought them out of Egypt, he wanted to make sure that they had gold and silver because he knew that what, there was going to come a time that he was going to erect the tabernacle. He was going to erect the place of meeting. And he was going to make it excellent for uh, his own name's sake. And he was preparing to utilize some of the things that they had been blessed with. And here Moses is receiving a word about going back to the people and telling them what God said. And they are down there taking the blessing of God and turning it into an idol. I can't anybody can you see the contrast there but don't you see the same thing working in our culture today God blesses us God gets us to a good place God shows us uh, open doors and we mess right around and while God is trying to get a message to you about who I've called you to be what I want to utilize in your life we're somewhere making it into a golden idol we are worshiping and I, I can't get anybody that'll help me maybe 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 See, see, God looks now at Aaron. Aaron was mixed up. Look, come on, look at what, they built this thing. Look at verse 5. Y'all still walking with me? Chapter 32, verse 5. So when Aaron saw it, after he had molded this golden calf, he built an altar before it. Now this is the one that God left in charge. That Moses left in charge. Aaron made an altar before it. Now get this, what he said. See, I'm going to tell you about when somebody is delirious. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Now wait a minute, come on. I thought the golden calf was the new God. Huh? Isn't that what he said? But Aaron is so mixed up that after he built the altar and he said tomorrow will be the festival to the Lord, yet he's using an idol. You see, because the truth is there was the inherent need to connect with the unseen God that's really in everybody that's created. God has left a vacant place in every person, and he is the only one that can fill it. And here Aaron is now knowing that God is God, and yet he has created this idol, and now he's trying to mix it up. He says, we have built this idol, we have made an altar before it, and tomorrow we're going to have a festival, we're going to have a feast unto the Lord. That's crazy, that's mixed up, and he is deceived because uh, you got to understand that the people uh, always, if you aren't careful, need the present evidence of a God. They, they, they had those in Egypt. They had gods and things that the people in Egypt worshipped. And here they are now, make us a God. See, when we always want to be like the world. Isn't that something? Why is that? Huh? Why do we always want to be like the world? That's why I said we're so full of culture. That's what happened with uh, when, when David uh, and during that time when the first king of Israel, God, the people, God said, I'm going to lead you. The people said, no, we want a king like the nations around us. Ask your neighbor, say, neighbor, why do you want to be so much like the world? Y'all whispering that. Why you? Ask them, get them indignance. Why, you want, why, why, why do we want to be so much like the world? All right, they need it. They need it. They need it to connect with the unseen God, Aaron did, and then yet they were so deceived that they needed the present evidence of God's existence. And that happens systematically uh, and it has been an issue throughout the history of religion and the people. And they, they built Baal. And in current day, uh, we got religious traditions. We've got rituals. We've got icons. We've got symbols. We've got things. And, and as long as we can see those things, we believe that's the evidence that God is in our lives. But can I tell us something? That both sides can create some stuff. In other words... God can create some things, but the devil can too. Huh, come on now. Don't let 
things be your only evidence that there is a God that's existing. Because you remember when Moses went down to Pharaoh and uh, Moses threw his rod down and became a serpent? Well, guess what? Pharaoh's man threw one down and it became a serpent too. He picked it back up. It became a rod again. So listen, don't get mixed up to think uh, that the evidence that God is present is based on things that you can put your hands tangibly on. But we make these idols, and we got these icons, and, and uh, cultural symbols, and all kinds of things. Now, now notice, go quickly down to verse number 11. God, in verse, go to verse number 8. God said um, to Moses in verse 7, go down. For your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. Quickly now. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, this is your God. He said, go down, these stiff-necked people. Huh? And God says, leave me alone, Moses. My wrath is burning hot against them. And I, I may consume them, and I will make you a great nation. Moses pleaded with the Lord, his God, and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out to harm them, he, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. And, and, and so God and Moses are here, and they, they have begun to debate as to who brought the people out of Egypt. God said, look, go down there to those people that you brought out. <laughs> Moses said, wait a minute, God, you brought the people out of Egypt. They got so hard-headed and, and stubborn that they were debating and, and, and going back and forth. But, but Moses stood in the gap for the people. And then Moses was angry because of the people shifting to strange mixing of human reliance and divine allegiance. And we are often guilty of the same thing today. Huh? Human reliance. Depending on us, depending on our systems, but depending on the things we have established in culture to bring us through, to take us through. That's why we get so upset with the justice system. Is man created? Is, is human ingenuity, all right? Filled with flaws and imperfections, that, and yet we get upset when it doesn't work like it ought to work. It, it is not going to work like it ought to work all the time because it is of human substance. And we start trying to mix human reliance and divine allegiance. The Bible said they turn quickly. Now, Moses was so angry, and I'm about done. The Bible said that he threw the tablets. Go down to verse number 19. Moses comes down of the mountain. Let me fast forward. As they're coming down, God said, go down and deal with them. And, of course, Joshua had been up uh, half the way with Moses, and, and he heard the sound in the camp. And Joshua said, my God, there's a noise of war. Mo Moses says in 18, no, it's not the noise of a shout of victory. It's not the noise of a cry of defeat. But it's the sound of singing I hear and playing. All right? The sound of singing and playing. They were frolicking. They were orgying. They were drinking everything under the sun. They were dancing. When Moses came down, they were just... Uh, you know, having a good time, just crazy, loose, just all over the place. And the Bible says as soon as he saw it, his anger became hot and he cast the tablets of his hand and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire. 
Is that what the Bible says? He burned it in the fire and scattered the powder and made them drink it. Now, I come to this point. He was so angry that he created a fire and threw the calf in it. There comes a time, and here's the point, when you have to be sincere enough to ask God to burn it all down. You got to get real enough to desire, God, that's what I need you to do. I need you to burn it, burn it all down. And I thought about that. Anything that I have replaced with truth needs to be burned down. Okay? You all are familiar with the song, Burn It All Down. It says this, Lexi, I remember how I used to worship and said that nothing else could have my love. I would dance before my king and daily I would sing of your goodness and your mercy. My intentions have been pure. But I've strayed, and my passion for your heart has been displaced. Bring me back to where I first believed in your light. Lord, I'm sorry for what I've become. And then the chorus says, burn it all down and leave only you. Let nothing stand in the place of your truth. All that we've made, the buildings we've raised, all that's in vain, you can take it away and leave only you. Leave only you. If my ambition blocks the path where you lead, and if my drive directs my heart from destiny, Lord, if I ever lose my way and my own desire overtake me with your holy fire, burn it all down. Somebody look at your neighbor's neighbor, burn it all down. That's what we want. Burn it all down, but leave only you. And let nothing stand in the place of your truth. Now, now, anything that I have replaced with truth, my rituals, my religious system, my stuff, my conscientiousness, my self-sufficiency, when the power of God comes, the true revelation of truth comes, there will be a voluntary throwing into the fire any and everything that has been a substitute and attempt to join or replace both. I recall, I recall over in the book of Acts, chapter number 19. It says, if you look at chapter 19, go there very quickly and go down to verse number 13. I won't read it all, but it says that, that uh, when, when the men of God, the apostles began to move by the power of God, and, and there were those, uh, they saw healings by handkerchiefs. They saw deliverance. They, they saw men get up and evil spirits left them. And, and uh, people became empowered by uh, God. People became saved and, and so forth. And the Bible says down, uh, let's look down at verse, let's see. Go to verse number. 19. It says, also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. My point is that when the true spirit of revelation, when the true power of God comes, whenever there's the acknowledgement of truth, all other systems you will voluntarily burn down. Don't forget Israel was in the process of moving in the plan and the purpose of God on their way. And a delay caused diversion and deception. And I got to make sure you understand that if you know what God is doing, if you know where God is taking you, if you know what God has promised you, if you know what God has purposed in you specifically, you may have to get to a place where you say, burn it all down. The, the request to burn it all down is a bold and daring one. And it is dependent, get this, 
It is dependent upon what you have erected in the place of truth. It can be any number of things. But you better know Jesus said that if your eye offends you, you need to pluck it out. It's better to go through life, halt, or with one eye than to end up off course with him. If your hand is offending you, you need to chop it off. In other words, he says, you got to get rid of every, any and everything that tries to replace itself with truth that will try to hinder you, hinder your purpose, and it depends on what it is. Whenever your priority and your perspectives are right, you can say, burn it all down because you know that you have pursued the kingdom first. And even this morning, if you have not allowed your possessions to possess you, you don't mind saying burn it all down. Anything that would hinder me, anything that would block me, anything that I have set up as an idol, burn it all down and leave only you. You have the right perspective that if I have somehow gotten off course, if I've somehow gotten off my purpose, I want it burned down. Anything that I have considered or tried to replace the truth, would burn it down. Anything that I possess as an idol, anything I have accomplished that I've allowed to be an idol, my religion that ignores your word is an idol. Burn it all down. Our systems that try to cause us to be moral without the word, burn it all down and leave only you. Anything that I have used to get me to the purpose and the destiny, yet I'm not walking in your word. God, burn it all down. I need for you to get me to my destiny. I need for you to be the door opener. I need for you to be the way maker. I will not establish anything, even in my delays, even when it doesn't seem like it's working, even when it seems like there's a hesitation. There's an interruption. You got to still keep your focus. You got to still keep your mind. You got to still stay with God because if not, you will begin to mix in your own flavor. You'll begin to mix in your own style of religion. You begin to try to now get you to your destiny and it causes us to get off track. How many have gone out of the way when you did it your way? Come on, somebody. You know what the word said. You've been hearing God, and you know that it took your way out. These people were on purpose. These people were headed to destiny. And because they hit a delay, because they had an interruption, they allowed themselves to try to erect their own method, their own brand, their own fulfilling of destiny. Is there anybody in here who is bold enough to say, God, whatever that's in the way of truth, burn it all down. Huh? You got, see, see, you got to have your allegiance in God now. Because when you say that, and you have made some of this stuff your idol, and it gets burned down, you get upset, you get angry, you get hostile with God. But, but, but if you really want to get rid of the golden calves, God, I can walk in my purpose without the golden calf. God, I can see you better without the golden calf. I don't need to erect something that I have ascribed by my own means, by human ingenuity to get me to my purpose in God. And today, we're in a culture, we're in a society, we are people who have allowed ourselves to put our trust in every kind of system, everything we've developed out of our own intellect, our own man-made ways. But they will never, can never 
get us to the place of victory in Christ Jesus. Can I ask somebody who believes and trusts that God, I know that I have sought you first and anything that's in my life that I have put before you, burn it all 